Thank you, Laura. Actually, I guess you can guess that I had an awesome dinner conversation last night because we sat together. Um, as you can see, she has a lot more to tell, and I hope we get a little bit more out of her in the discussion. But now, Chris, the floor is yours. Okay, um, my name's um, Chris Taggart. Uh, I'm an open data entrepreneur, I guess. There are not many of us about. Uh, there are even few of us making money yet. Um, but that's one of the purposes of entrepreneurs, to do things where there is, as yet, no proven business model. Um, I developed a, a site, Openly Local, almost by accident. My background is as a journalist and ma ran a magazine, my own uh, magazine publishing company, where we scraped local council websites against the terms and conditions, and, um, and then uh, the UK government said, we like what you're doing, come and advise us. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm the co-founder of Open Corporates, which I'll talk about a bit more later, and on various advisory boards, including ones for the government. Um, so I want to talk a bit about open data and, and its role in entrepreneurship and its role in society and what it means to be an uh, open data entrepreneur and why every single entrepreneur needs to get and understand uh, open data. We live in a big data world. Um, I'm working on a presentation at the moment. Um, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be for, but it's going to be titled, Daddy, what did you do in the big data wars? Because we are currently in the big data wars. We've been in them for a year or two. And uh, we're in a world where there is enormous amounts of data, and it's growing exponentially each year, from uh, crime data, uh, Facebook, internet-enabled um, parking meter, uh, apps, location data, um, shopping data, just huge amounts of stuff. Uh, and in a big data world, um, there's, there's concentrations of power. And the power comes from, first from access. Can you get hold of the data? And that's a really, really critical question. Helen and, uh, and Liam both touched on this um, earlier. Can you get hold of the data? And uh, critically, if you are already getting hold of it, and this is what the whole PSI re regime is currently based on, can you stop other people getting it? Because that will give you a competitive advantage. And one way, a classic way of doing this is pricing it out of reach. Um, can you reuse this? There's much freedom of information legislation around, but, much, but, but actually pretty much none of it allows for um, uh, reuse. Can you do something with it? Can you pass on that data, uh, work in a collaborative, distributed way, or does it, is it one that um, only you can use in a certain way? Do you actually understand what you're talking about? Um, uh, do you understand the data? Do you have the understanding of doing it? This is a really a big problem for innovation, and, and actually for democracy as well. Because at the moment, with public sector information, it's about, um, you, you, it is about access for those people who pay. And that means it favors incumbents. You know, Dun & Bradstreet reportedly pay around about 100,000 euros for the Belgian company data each year. Now, there are not many companies that could afford to do that for something that's actually not that significant. And they can do it because they've got a huge customer base. And actually, it's a business advantage for them to pay that because it, it restricts access to that information for others. It stifles innovation and increases the costs for the end user as well. And it particularly increase, it, it leads to inevitable monopolies. Google, you know, we heard a, a bit about Google today and last night. And, um, but Google can buy its way out of trouble to a degree. It can buy Mo Motorola or buy data sets and uh, uh, buy missiles, if you like, in this mutually assured destruction world of, of uh, software patents and, and big data. Uh, and it inevitably means that if there's a data set that is only sold, then for someone like Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever to buy it, it's trivial. So it, it naturally creates monopolies and, and kills diversity and kills innovation. We're, you know, somebody asked me about open data, and we've, it was touched on the previous session about the, the, the use of open data. We're already in a data-rich, data-poor world. Government produces and has a lot of data, but frankly, it hasn't a clue what to, what to do with it. None of it's connected. It doesn't know how to do it. It doesn't understand it. And actually, the amount of data it's got is, is dwarfed by you know, uh, a supermarket. You know, so the biggest supermarket in the UK is Tesco, which isn't just a supermarket, collecting loyalty data, collecting information about buying habits, collecting information about uh, what's going on in that particular area. It's also a mobile phone provider. It's also a bank. 
you know, put those together, and, and it's also in strong in Korea and you know, growing in other parts of the world, then you have some um, pretty big things. Google, give Google your payment information, then you've got some worrying things going on there. We have a, we are already in a data rich, but data poor divide, and the community, but also governments as well, are in, a, are in that data poor side. Thomas Jefferson reportedly said that information is the currency of democracy, and I think if he was around today, he'd be saying data is the currency of democracy, because without that information, we can't make informed decisions. And companies, you know, um, we've seen over the last few years, um, and, then, uh, and we've heard actually in every single se uh, session today about how important company data is. You know, companies, just going back to first principles, a company is a non-natural person. It's an entity that's created that has legal rights. And back, you know, way, way back into the, um, you know, they're quite recent, but, but in terms of doing business, the Companies Act in the UK was the, um, was the, the really big thing that happened in the, in the world um, in 1844. Um, because it needed, a company prior to that needed an act of parliament. In the States, it needed the law to be passed. Um, in order to form a company. So we create these things. They're very they're important and they're powerful. Limited liability means that when a company goes bust, it's not the shareholders that suffer, it's the suppliers, it's the customers, and it's the community. Now, actually, that's a, a really counterintuitive thing to, to endorse, but the payoff is, is that we get innovation, we get prosperity, and we get a vibrant ecosystem for people trying things um, and, and, and preparing to fail. But it means that we have to get that unless that, otherwise that payoff just doesn't work. Government's collecting huge amounts of data about companies. Um, again, we've heard today about the, the uh, product data, environmental data, planning data, health data, political contributions, court case, I mean, it goes on. It's all collected pretty much for statutory purpose. Um, other businesses would find it fantastically useful. Um, uh, some of it is increasingly, is, is even becoming open data, but almost exclusively, um, it doesn't use company identifiers. Or where it does it use company identifiers, for example, the EPA information in America, the Environmental Protection Agency, they use propriety company identifiers that can't be reused, either by government or by uh, the wider world. So this is what my company, uh, my effort, um, Open Corporates, is, is about the project. Um, we're, we're, we're doing... We're, we're setting out to, to be a database, an open database for, for company data. And specifically, we've got one core central role, and that is to create a URL for every company in the world, whether it's in the UK, or Delaware, or Spain, or Kazakhstan, or wherever. We want to create a company based on, uh, for every company, in the, a URL for every company in the world. And more than that, we want it to be an open URL, that we're not creating a new monopoly system, this is, the, this is the sort of the, the format of the URL. It's basically companies, then the ISO code for the jurisdiction, which may be a country like, the, like GB, or it may be a, a, something like USDE uh, for Delaware, for example. And then the, the, the company number that is, was issued when that company was formed, and that is the legal identifier for that company. We already have these unique IDs. We just needed a way of placing it into a URL. And I'm really pleased to say that the, the UK companies, uh, company register, uh, we'd had discussions with them, and they're going to be using the same path structure, the same URL structure as, as, as we are. And that's been, that's been fantastically um, good, having those discussions with them. And, you know, I hadn't actually, wasn't really looking at the product data, but we talked about this, and actually ERP as well. You know, it's the sort of thing that... Um, is uh, everybody needs to, to know what they're talking about when they're talking about companies. And the reason is, is that when push comes to shove, the legal entity is what matters. When you sign a contract with somebody, when a government signs a contract, when a you, you as a, another company sign a contract with somebody, you need to know what that legal entity is. You know, you need to understand BP. What was BP? You know, in terms of, uh, was BP, BP um, Inc., uh, registered in Delaware, was it BP drilling or something? You know, what, what, what was it? It was a network of companies, but actually understanding that and understanding is critical to understanding where the liability lies, and they had to make levers uh, to, to influence that. Go, that, that. Um, we've got a, one of, the, one of the things that you often find is that, um, is that we have these, you know, uh, companies, governments have these lists of companies, and all they're doing is they're storing names. 
and, and names are, 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 the names are wrong as well in many cases. Um, we've been cleaning up the Electoral Commission data and actually the data for the Information Commissioner in the UK. And it's all over the place. It's a mess. I mean, the names are wrong. The companies never existed. Companies are wrong. You know, it's supposed to be up to date, but it isn't. Uh, spellings are wrong. All sorts of things. And um, there's this fantastic tool which everyone should have a play around with called Google Refine for cleaning up data. And we've got a, a matching service, a reconciliation service for matching those against the legal entities. Um, and, and we're also collecting data. So, for example, we're matching up with the Security and Exchange Commission data, uh, and that's important because there's a huge amount of there's a huge amount of data um, uh, there, health and safety um, notices, um, information protection, um, data protection information, uh, trademarks, and so on. And everything's under the Open Database license, so it's all openly licensed. And also, it's been built with the open data community. They've gone out and scraped things like Montenegro. They've, you know, we've got, um, um, whether it's Cyprus or India, we've got a million Indian companies in there. We've got Croatia in there. We've got all 7,000 Greenland companies in there, just because somebody went out and did a scraper to, to do that. So why should you care? And fundamentally, um, when we're in a big data world, um, and access to data is, our lives are not just dependent on data. I mean, arguably our lives are governed by data, going back to, in the UK, the, the, the doomsday book. But our lives are data now, and businesses are data. Businesses can't exist with it. And access to, to data, access to public sector information, access to company data is absolutely going to be critical for the ability to succeed and to compete. Um, you can't run a business without accessing data about other companies. And if you have to go to a gatekeeper, which is what you currently have to do and is what you'll likely have to do with the absence of something like open corporates, then uh, you just don't get that data. You can't match it up, you can't combine it, you can't understand supplier chains, you can't understand anything. Um, in government, governments increasingly have difficulties taxing companies, regulating them, understanding them. You know, when America wanted to work out who's at fault when the, in the Gulf oil, oil spill, then it was really difficult. Was BP even a, a, a British company, an American company? Had more American shareholders than it had British shareholders. But where was it? You know, critical parts of it were offshore. Um, and the, um, the, uh, uh, as far as actually, uh, you know, a democratic, a fair society goes, then if you've got a situation where you can look, but you can't touch, you can't reuse, then that's not really public. In a world where, the, where data is power, then we need to be able to reuse that. And actually, finally, you know, a poor, poor access to this company information means that we don't have a proper market. If you've got incumbents, big incumbents, big monopolies who've got masses of information to it, and, and who, can, who can afford the data which you can't, then you've got rent-seeking almost by definition. You've got de facto exclusive arrangements. And finally, you've also got a fertile ground for corruption as well. So I think anybody that's an entrepreneur and that doesn't think that open data matters to them actually doesn't understand the role of data in their business and in the markets that they're dealing with. I'm trying to build a data a company and starting to succeed um, based on one, not just using open data, but making data available to people. I think it's really important, and I think it's more important that also more, more companies like, like mine as well doing this. Thank you.